Hi, in this video, I'm going to deal with a question that many people ask. How much time should be spent practicing each day? Now, I'm a realist about these things. Um, realist both in terms of what children get up to in their lives. They're busy going to school and involved in their out of school activities and so on and so forth. And obviously the youngsters who are musicians are often into other things as well. So time is limited. And certainly I understand as a parent that time is limited as well. So to some extent, it's kind of making as much time as is reasonable. One thing that doesn't work so well is when life just becomes a bit busy, that the temptation is to miss out days at a time or to have some massive panic practice session the night before the next lesson. And really, if you think of practice as being most fruitful in terms of little and often, Obviously, if you could do a lot of practice often, that would be fantastic, but at least better to do a little bit of practice each day than to have one lump or two lumps of practice uh, in a week, because this is something we're chipping away at daily. We're getting into training for, we're building skills, building technique. So better to drip feed that on a regular basis than it is just to do it in lumps. And one person once told me that to uh, practice learning to play an instrument should be about as much trouble as owning a pet dog. So if you think about a pet dog, and some of you may well have one, well, the dog's got to be fed every day. You can't really just to decide not to feed the dog some days. You've got to provide water. You've got to take the dog for a walk, even if the weather's appalling and you're far too busy to do it. So worth just thinking, how much trouble is it to have a pet dog and how do we manage to deal with having a pet dog even when we're too busy to take on what needs doing. It's an interesting kind of little parallel with this, isn't it? One little guide that's quite useful is just to think in terms of grades. If you've got youngsters who are working towards grades that you might think about 10 minutes per day for each grade. So grade one, 10 minutes a day, grade two, 20 minutes a day, grade three, 30 minutes a day, and so on, would be a very useful kind of overall guide. Now, there'll be plenty of people who are, haven't yet got to grade one or who are at grade one standards who just love playing the piano or the clarinet or singing or whatever they're doing, and they may well manage a bit more than that, which is fantastic. It may be that on some days you can't quite manage even to fit in those 10 minutes, but as a rough guide, it's quite useful. Now, obviously, if you're blowing something, a wind instrument or a brass instrument, then in the early stages, fatigue will set in early and you don't want to overplay and kind of ruin your embouchure and the muscles just all kind of collapse and it becomes impossible to produce a decent sound. So don't overplay. On the other hand, all this strength has to be built up and stamina is something that can defeat people if they're not in a regular routine with it. So it's very important for those players. And just to get used to what you're doing physically, you know, just holding a string instrument, where how you hold a bow, all this kind of stuff. So you just get kind of daily practice at doing that, sitting at the piano with the right kind of posture. You know, all these things are essential parts of a regularly practiced routine. And in my experience, the best way of doing this is to try and have a regular slot in the daily schedule. Again, it will have to be flexible. But if you have a youngster and indeed you're a parent yourself who's a good early riser, then actually doing some practice before the school day begins is a fantastic time of day when youngsters are fresh and alert and could get some practice in before they have to go to school. Obviously, if they've got to go to school very early, they've got lots of traveling to do, that may not be the best time. Doing practice when they come in from school, not always the best idea because depending on how young they are, they're probably fairly tired. So maybe just building in a short break, you know, drink and just a little bit of play time for the youngsters and then maybe to do it before you get to evening meals and so on. 
difficult, I know, because you may well be the person trying to prepare the evening meal as well as supervising the, the practice becomes a bit tricky, doesn't it? But anyway, whatever it is, a kind of regular slot, a regular slot just before bed, not probably the greatest thing for a young person particularly, because then that's the point of the day when, when they're exhausted and find it difficult to concentrate. So, but trying to see if there's a regular slot that works well. And thinking at the weekends as well, weekends are often sometimes a bit more sort of flexible, aren't they, with time? But is it a good idea to get the practice done before the day starts to unfold? Otherwise, the day unfolds, you get to the end of the day and you think, oh, I haven't done any practice. So having some kind of routine, and I think it's particularly helpful for youngsters, and I have to say it's probably just as well for adults as well, to have it as part of the routine so that just as every day you remember to put your clothes on and hopefully remember to brush teeth and all these things that have to be done, this just becomes part of the natural routine. So hopefully that gives a little bit of general help with how much time to spend on this and just how to organise things so that it happens on a regular basis. Don't go on a guilt trip if you miss a day. On the other hand, have some kind of routine if you can, just to help that, that routine to be maintained. So on to this next question then. Well, what do we do in that time? Because I've spoken to a lot of parents who are really keen that their children should learn to make music, and they're really keen to be part of the whole thing and to sit there and offer encouragement, but they don't really know what their youngsters should be doing. And I've also spent a lot of time with adults who sometimes spend hours each day playing an instrument or singing, but are not really sure what they should be doing with their time. So let's have a little unpack of what the kind of key elements might be in the time that you've got. And obviously, if you're at the 10 minutes a day stage, it's gonna be pretty difficult to pack all this in, and you might have to spread some of this over a sort of two day pattern or something. But certainly as you get into it, it should be possible to pack in various ingredients to the practice. Well, just in terms of relating this to sport or something, it's a good idea to warm up. You don't just suddenly jump onto the pitch and play 90 minutes of football. You do a little bit of warming up, bit of limbering up first. Quite a good idea. So this is something that um, you might want to speak to a youngster's teacher about. Are there any particular kind of warm-up exercises that would be particularly helpful for the instrument that you're dealing with? So you get some advice on that and you've got something tangible that you can point to that's, that's in a book or committed to memory that you can just spend a bit of time uh, just going through. Different things would be appropriate at different levels as well. So some very simple exercises at first, and particularly those exercises can be fun. Obviously, it's something that a youngster will want to do. So a bit of warm up. There's, as time and a half goes by, those technical exercises might become a bit more formal, a bit more challenging, a bit more stamina building. Um, and you're going to get into playing scales and arpeggios before you know it. Now, the first thing to talk about there is, you know, what is the point of playing scales and arpeggios? We will come back and talk a bit about this later. But because a lot of youngsters don't like scales or arpeggios, can't see the point, and they just want to play pieces. But it actually has a number of purposes that are very helpful to musical development. One is, if you're playing a piece in the key of C major, if you can play the scale of C major, well, at least you know what the notes are that are gonna come up in that piece in C major. So as they begin to explore music in different keys, making sure they can play the scale for that key is gonna be very helpful. If they can play the arpeggio for that key, that's helpful as well. Because if you think about it, music is either in organized in notes that are moving by step, or those notes are leaping. So it's either doing some kind of scale movement or it's doing some kind of arpeggio movement. So if we've got a feel for the key, which sharps or flats might be used in the scales and the arpeggios, we'll kind of be expecting those in the music. And we're also getting this practice at doing things that 
playing from one note to the next on the piano or any other instrument, leaping between notes. So we get these scale and arpeggio patterns going. They're also useful for a number of other things as well. For example, when, you, when you're playing a scale or an arpeggio, can you play it with nice even rhythm? Or is it all a little bit lumpy? I mean, you hear people play scales like this. Well, actually, all the rhythm's uneven there, isn't it? So one thing that scales are very helpful for is developing even rhythm. That would apply to any instrument. Another thing that scales are good for is kind of just thinking, can we move cleanly from one note to the next? So that we join the notes up, we've got lovely smooth playing, but we're really kind of clean in the exchanges between the notes. Now, whether that's about tonguing on a wind or a brass instrument, whether it's about the kind of you know clarity of bow changes for a string player, whether it's about fingers on a keyboard instrument, you know, the means are uh, specific to the instrument, but the kind of effect of what we're trying to achieve is the same. Clean exchanges of notes. Some people actually don't ever really play smoothly. They have gaps between the notes. So it's not smooth. Other people are over-connected, so they smudge all their notes because the first note's still down when the second note's playing, like this. And it all just sounds a bit kind of messy. So, one thing that scales and arpeggios are very good for is actually developing the ability to play really smoothly with all the notes really connected, but with clean exchanges. So that's a very useful thing because obviously if you can do that in scales, you can also then do it in pieces. Another aspect of scale playing is to try and deliver these things with even sound, what we call even tone. And it's funny how if people don't set about doing this in their scale playing, when it comes to pieces, you get kind of lumps, you know, notes that stick out or notes that disappear on you. So, you know, sometimes you hear people play scales like this. So I've got loud notes, I've got quiet notes, I've got, in this case, the thumbs dropping onto the piano and producing accented notes. You know, we could have that being generated by other means. So when you're tonguing, what's your level of control in the tonguing? Is that nice and even? When you're changing bows or trying to move on a single bow, is that all happening nice and evenly? Or we got lumps in the sound, have we got notes sticking out? Kind of jarred bow changes or if we got an over attack at the beginning of the note or is the attack not clean at the beginning of the note for for wind and brass players you know as i say different things for different instruments but trying to ensure that we can get an even tone so all these things are incredibly helpful so it's not that scales and arpeggios are there as some kind of torture to try and put people off they're actually there to enable all sorts of things to happen that are technical and that are musical and that help us to understand where we're coming from in terms of the key of the piece. So certainly, you know, once the initial stages have uh, got underway, building in these scales and arpeggios, gradually acquiring new keys, being able to do more octaves, uh, different kinds of articulations later on, that's all an important part of the practice. Now, obviously, most of the practice time is going to be spent on, on pieces. Uh, that's what people enjoy doing and that's why they're learning to play an instrument or to sing because they want to perform pieces and that's fine. And obviously this is something that as a parent you don't need to worry about particularly because the teacher hopefully will be guiding through the delivery of the material. It's just how is this material being used at home. So most of the time going to be spent on pieces but one important thing to say about this in terms of practice is that there is a big difference between playing and practicing. And some people think they're practicing when in fact all they're doing is playing. So if you start a piece at the beginning and you spend a whole chunk of your practice time just playing from the first note to the last note, well, sometimes it's appropriate to be able to play through the piece and think, have I got this sorted? Is it all working? Is it flowing? Is it going at the right speed? Is there anything that I just need to tidy up? But when we're practicing, certainly when we're learning a piece, much better to take small chunks 
and to work on them in some detail before we move on. As much as anything else, it's very time consuming when you're encountering a new piece to try and play from the beginning to the end. It just takes forever and then all your practice time's gone or you don't make it to the end. And the, the danger of that for a youngster is they get to the end of um, practicing that when in fact they've been playing it and just think this is too difficult, I can't do it. And then that becomes demotivating. But actually, if you just take a short passage, might be four bars, might be two bars, might even be just one bar, and you think if you're doing this on the piano, for example, just play the right hand notes over and over again. So we've really got the notes, we've got the fingers, we've got the rhythm, we know exactly what we're doing. Then do the same thing in the left hand, checking out all these different details. Are we playing the right notes? Are we counting a steady pulse? Is the rhythm right? Is the tone even? Are all these exchanges clean? Are we doing what we should be doing? Is it loud? Is it quiet? Are the notes smooth? Are the notes detached? Is there anything else we should be doing with them? You know, get all those things going. Then can I do it hands together? And if I can do this bar, well then I can uh, apply the same process to the next bar. Then maybe I can play those two bars together. Again, it will be different things. On melodic instruments, you haven't got all this business about right hand first, then left hand or vice versa. You know, you might be just reading a single line, but same things apply. Am I playing the right notes? Have I got the right fingering? Have I got the right bowing? Um, is the rhythm in place? Does it sound good? That's an important thing, you know. Am I producing a decent sound or is this a rather kind of pale tone? Or is it a bit harsh because it's all being overblown or, you know, the attack's not quite right? You know, let's, let's really work on all these things and get a short passage of music going really well. And then maybe when you come back tomorrow, you might spend a bit of time just revising what you did yesterday, just to make sure that's still in place. And then you can move on and work on the next passage. But actually over the time span, it's a much more efficient way of working rather than trying to take on the whole piece and it not actually really making much progress, but to work in these small chunks and to see if we can really get those small chunks going well, then try to connect them. It may not be the best idea to just work the piece from the beginning to the end, sort of going A to Z. Sometimes you notice that a bit that comes at the beginning of a piece comes back later in the piece. So once you've got the first bit going, you might think, well, let's see if we can check this bit out as well. That will be good. Some of the time, hopefully this is something that a teacher will have helped a youngster to do, or an adult, um, to look through the piece and actually think, are there any patterns that recur? So you might be able to practice a pattern of notes. You know, if you have a passage in the piece that goes like this. Well, that's something that could be practiced. It might then come back in the next bar and go. So it's the same music, but it's just gone up a note. So we could kind of draw out some of these different patterns inside the piece. Then maybe if you're playing a keyboard instrument, certain chords that come round more than once. So we could get used to playing this chord in the first and second bar, and then when it comes back a bit later, get used to playing it there. But maybe the right hand's changed. So can we do the original version? Can we do the altered version down here? So sometimes you might take a piece out of order and then kind of reconstruct it in order as the various ingredients of the piece start to come together. So the way we work on this is, is really critical, that we're doing quality practice, not just trying to play through the piece. Now, as well as doing some technical work and working on pieces, we want to spend a bit of time each day sight reading. Now, that's another thing that causes some young people and certainly a lot of adults to kind of groan, oh, sight reading, I hate sight reading. Well, you only get better at sight reading by doing it. And one thing that happens if we live exclusively on a diet of pieces, and maybe we're living with, you know, two or three pieces for quite a long time, is that actually we're not really reading it very quickly. We're, we learn it, we memorise it, at least we semi-memorise it, and then we're just repeating this thing from memory. And maybe looking at the music, it's kind of reminding us roughly what's going on but somehow we've internalized it and we don't really need to read it. The advantage of sight reading is that, of course, what you're doing is encountering a new piece of music every time you sit down. And in the long run, that is such a useful skill and it's going to improve faster learning of pieces as time goes by. 
if you kind of start with a piece that you memorize and then you think, great, I can, I can play this from memory, but I don't really know what all these notes are, then that's fine, it's a short piece. But a bit further down the line, when you're trying to learn an eight page piece, it's gonna take forever. So learning to read as you go is a really uh, integral skill. So at the beginning, very simple sight reading exercises. Again, um, the teacher will supply all this stuff, point you in the right direction of resources. So they just get used to reading a few notes each day. And, and again, we'll talk more about the kind of technique of how to go about that later. I also think it's great if youngsters can have a little bit of time doing some improvisation, just making things up. In fact, some of the youngest players love making up tunes and, uh, you know, just sort of trying a few notes out, just being experimental, being free to do what they want to, and then evaluating it in some way. So they play something and think, well, that note sounds a bit funny. Well, is there another note that sounds better? So they're kind of getting their ears in gear with what's going on. They're experimenting under their fingers or under their fingers or under their fingers that way, you know, just to kind of get used to, okay, that sounds good. That doesn't sound quite so good. Maybe making up tunes that are in the same key as one of their pieces or one of the scales that they're doing. So we get a bit of kind of interrelationship between the various ingredients of the practice, but sort of doing something a bit creative or just doing some mood music, you know, just making up a short piece that is about something, you know, it could be rainbows or storm cloud, you know, would have a different kind of mood, wouldn't it? So getting used to being a bit imaginative and, and taking away some of the fear of playing the instrument, just being free to play without having to worry about, I've got to play that note and it's got to have this number of beats and it's got to be this finger, um, just being free to play. And it builds a bit of confidence. Actually, interestingly, often builds a bit of confidence with the sight reading as well as everything else. Now, some time of this practice slot in this ideal world might be spent on some kind of oral development, you know, just getting the ears work working. And improvisation we've referred to, that's one way of doing it. Um, as, you know, uh, youngsters start to climb up the exam system, there are all sorts of resources out there where the specific oral tests can be practiced. And uh, we've, we've certainly got those available on our website as well. So you can really kind of sort of tool up for dealing with the specifics of oral tests for exams. Um, but, you know, just using the ears, listening to what's going on, relating to the practice. You know, is that note louder than this note? Or, you know, have I smudged those notes? You know, what's going on there? Can I think of a tune that I know? Maybe something I've heard on the TV or something. Uh, can I find the notes of that tune? You know, that's good oral development. Just trying on your instrument and thinking, oh no, I've got the first three notes of that TV theme, but the fourth note sounds wrong. Can we find the right note? You know, this is all good oral development. Maybe trying to vocalize a little bit, sort of starting to sing some of the tunes that we're playing on an instrument. All very good for general oral development. Listening to music. I find this often happens actually, you get, you get young players who play music, but they don't ever really listen to it. They hear music, slightly different thing, because you can't really avoid it. You can hear music all around you, but actually really listening to music, going to concerts, putting on a radio and really listening to a piece intently and really hearing what's going on there, um, engaging with that, thinking about how it's being performed, listening to the quality of the tone listening to what's happening in terms of varying the volume, what we call the dynamics, uh, listening in terms of varying the articulation. That's what we mean by is it smooth or are the notes detached or is there kind of some accentuation? What's, you know, what's going on? All these different musical parameters that we are going to come back and talk about in more detail as we go through this course. But listening to the specifics of what's going on and thinking, now then, what's working here? and um, what could I take to my performance? Now, the listening bit doesn't have to be part of the practice time. That could be separated out of this and could be something that's done as a, a collective family activity or the opportunity to go to a concert or just to sit down and listen to a piece. Lots of music very easily accessible these days. 
So that's not difficult to, to get hold of. Certainly going to a live concert every now and again is a wonderful opportunity because you can listen to recordings, but actually being there live can really fire the imagination of um, aspiring musicians. Now, here's another popular idea um, that it's a good idea to spend a bit of time doing some musical theory. Uh, what a lot of people do is that they kind of spend their time playing pieces and they get really quite far on with things, but they don't really know much theory. Well, even from the early stages, you want to know what a treble clef is, what a bass clef is, if you need one, you know, what time signatures mean, where the notes are on the stave, what the different rhythms look like, you know, all kind of basic theory that needs to be kind of got on board at a fairly early stage. And as the playing develops, we need to acquire more of this. And I find lots of people are just playing catch up with theory all the time. They get to a certain level and then they say, oh my goodness, I've got to have grade five theory before I can take grade six. And actually their own theory level is maybe, you know, back at grade one somewhere. And then they've got to learn this whole chunk of theory in one go, which is a tough one, before they can move on. And that can be a sort of disabling of the playing. So trying to keep the theory going alongside, you know, again, a little and often. Doesn't have to be part of the practice lot, could be something that's put on at a different point in the day or added on to the practice. But just doing a little bit of that would be really good. And of course, apart from doing all this serious practice, there has to be time to enjoy and have fun. And often it's the case that young musicians have got a favorite piece that they live with for a while and they just want to play it and have fun with it. And why not? And if that comes towards the end of a, a practice session, it gives it all a bit of a lift and fires up the enthusiasm for maybe coming back next time and doing something. You know, some parents may have learned themselves and might be able to play duets with their youngsters uh, or might be able to accompany them at the piano if they're playing a melodic instrument. If that's not you, doesn't matter at all. They could still have one or two fun things up their sleeve that they could do and, and really enjoy just rounding off the practice with that. But it's about trying to get all of these things in balance. And if you think that most people have a profile that is kind of like pieces are the big thing, and then, well, maybe they've done some work on scales or a little bit of work on scales or not much work on scales. Sight reading's had about this much effort. Oral is kind of like, oh yeah, that's something I do a week or two before the exam. And theory, well, let's not worry about that until we have to. Actually, you can see that that's all out of balance. If you can get all these ingredients kind of working together, one assists the other all the time. And we just keep everything moving at an even pace going forwards. And then we don't meet walls where we can't do the next thing because we haven't done this thing. Or we're getting frustrated here because we can't read the stuff because we haven't done enough theory to make it happen, you know. So getting all these ingredients in balance. Um, now that's quite a lot to ask, isn't it? Um, but that would be a sort of ideal balanced picture. Some people find it helpful to have a workbook so maybe the um, teacher writes something in, in a book at a lesson, it doesn't have to be an essay, but it might just be a quick word about what's been done during the past week and setting the targets for the following week. That brings a lot of focus into what you're going to be doing with the practice can be a great assistance to a parent. So if you're a parent trying to supervise the practice, but you're sort of relying on your child to tell you what they should be doing, but you're not entirely sure that that's what it should be, uh, or you just want a bit more clarity yourself, and you know, most teachers wouldn't mind being asked just to jot something down in a book. Bits of paper get lost, but a little notebook that sits in the music case that could just have a few thoughts scribbled in it uh, would just help you as well as your youngster to be clear about what the objectives are for the coming week. And if you feel that maybe these ingredients are not quite in balance, then that's something that is perfectly legitimate to talk to a teacher about and just diplomatically raise the matter of, well, are we going to do some theory or is there another way we're going to do that? And one thing we're about at Music Matters is trying to resource people in all sorts of ways. So if you need to be doing oral tests specific to the grades, well, there may not be enough time in an instrumental lesson for a teacher to cover that as much as they would like to. 
You may have an instrumental teacher who doesn't play the piano, you know, all these things go on. So we've got all these um, video courses that are really targeted on all that stuff. So you download the one that you need and, and go for that. If you're thinking that the theory needs a bit of an extra push, maybe as a parent, you're not quite happy about that yourself. Maybe you're feeling that the teacher hasn't got time to do that or for whatever reason it's not being covered. Again, we've got courses that go grade by grade through all the teaching that's needed. And that's something that would be a resource for you as a parent, would be a resource for you as a learning adult, and is obviously primarily intended for someone who's needing to learn this stuff themselves. So good for youngsters. But a lovely thing for parents and youngsters to work through together. So we've got those resources there. So um, if you need those, feel free to use what we've got and that can sit alongside all the great work that you're doing with a, with a teacher. So my experience is that actually for youngsters, if they've got this routine of daily practice, they kind of know roughly how much time they're spending on it and they know what these different parameters are that they're trying to tackle, then actually you can come in as a parent in a very supportive way. What youngsters don't like, of course, is a sort of cajoling parent. You know, the parent is just says, well, you haven't done your practice today, or that's another wrong note you've just played. You know, actually trying to be affirming, positive, encouraging, sometimes a bit challenging, I know, especially when you're at the end of a long, hard day yourself and you've still got 103 jobs to do, um, but just kind of supervising it in a way that you feel a bit more informed about what you're trying to supervise. And we're gonna be just unpacking all this in more detail as we go. But I hope that gives some useful parameters to some pretty critical initial questions there. So come back and uh, we'll start to talk about you know, what, where we're going to go with this next.